So, Adam Robert, thanks very much for joining us on Hermetics Podcast. Thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so, we're going to be discussing uh, philosophy as a way of life, both as a as a philosophy, but also taking inspiration primarily from Pierre Hadot's text, "Philosophy as a Way of Life," which um, you know, I when I was messaging you and chatting about this beforehand, I sort of um, it's something I'd wanted to look into for a while, and you recommended Hado, and I think someone pointed me in your direction, and uh, yeah, so now it's all sort of come together. But before we uh, jump in on that, just tell us a little bit about yourself um, and what it is you do. Sure. Yeah. So I am a doctoral candidate at the California Institute of Integral Studies, which is a graduate school in San Francisco in the Bay Area. Um, I am. <laughs> perpetually trying to finish this this dissertation of mine, uh, which uh, the end is is in sight here um, within the next couple of months, hopefully. But the dissertation is actually on these themes that you just brought up. Um, so the key figure uh, in the dissertation is Pierre Hadot, his notion of philosophy as a way of life. And uh, relatedly, the core idea um, or sort of theme of the dissertation is ascesis or ascesis. And so the title of the dissertation is Ascesis and Perception Philosophy as a Way of Life. So uh, the dissertation is mostly a recovery of that term. Uh, it's been used um, and then a sort of general um, assessment or analysis of can we give a general philosophical account of this relation between ascesis, between practice and perception. How do our practices change our perception? So that's um, that's kind of the main... We were just saying I'm also the founding editor of a independent publisher called The Side View. Um, and The Side View is, is very much an extension or... Um, it's certainly inspired by Hado's sense of philosophy as practice. Um, and I basically get to explore those ideas with other thinkers, other writers, um, people from all kinds of different disciplines, not just uh, philosophy, but uh, scientists, psychologists, um, working with a lot of architects and designers right now, people who are concerned with this question of practice and perception. So that's kind of uh, where I'm at these days. Wow. Wow, so it's all centered around these themes. That's pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. um, okay, okay. Well, before we jump in uh, with the philosophy as a way of life itself, uh, I have to ask you the hermetics question. You can place three thinkers, living or dead, into a room and listen in on the conversation. Who do you pick? Yeah, I was thinking um, I had a couple of different versions of uh, an answer to this question. And um, <laughs> uh, we'll see We'll see how this lands with your listeners. But so my, my three are, one is a fellow, his name's Christopher Alexander. Uh, he is an architect as well as a software engineer. He's um, also the focus of, um, he's kind of my latest research focus. He does really fabulous, um, not just architecture and design, but uh, philosophy of architecture, where he draws uh, quite a bit from uh, the Platonic tradition, Platonic thinkers, um, also Alfred North Whitehead uh, in the process tradition. Uh, really fascinating insights in to um, philosophy and metaphysics and how they might bear on architecture. Um, so he's one person. Um, and the person that I would want to throw him into conversation with is um, Elon Musk, who is uh, sort of perennially in the news for um, saying and doing all kinds of things um, that sometimes he clearly understands at a very deep level. And then other times he, uh, in my opinion, at least um, is, is quite out of his depth. So I would like to put those two people into conversation because I think they're, they share a kind of engineering mindset they share a kind of respect for um, how difficult it is to work in material mediums um, and to get them to do what we want them to do but completely different um, philosophical worldview uh, metaphysical assumption 
Um, so I think that would be a, an interesting conversation. And then the third one um, I would throw in there is uh, Socrates or perhaps Plato's Socrates, um, because I think in, in both directions, um, there's quite a lot of um, philosophical assumption making that they both deploy in their kind of engineering projects that I think would be, they would benefit from that kind of Socratic questioning. Oh, why do you think that? Why is what, you know, why is, you know, just following those threads of the questions. Um, so I think that would be a good um, mediating factor. And I think um, as is the case in so many of the dialogues that um, the three of them might end in aporia, but I think that might be, that might be quite a good place um, to land. So those are my three. Do you do you see Elon Musk as someone who's living his own philosophy as a way of life? I <clears throat> I don't know. I I honestly don't know. Um, I I don't know much about him other than what he says in interviews. Um, I pick him because he's an incredibly idiosyncratic person. Um, he doesn't seem at least from my perspective, to be, um, he seems quite different than um, his other sort of tech CEO contemporaries. Um, and there's something a little bit wild and unhinged about him that makes me think that um, he could be open to a, a different set of ideas. Um, but I really, I really don't know if he, if he even believes in something like a coherent philosophy of life. Um, I, I, I couldn't say. But I think um, he's going to continue doing what he's doing, and we're all going to be downstream of uh, his decisions and activities. So I would, um, that's the other reason why I think somebody like Alexander would be a good conversation partner for him who thinks deeply about um, our building practices in terms of um, a human-centered world, say, are these enhancing our ability to flourish as human beings, as as whole people. Mm, okay, okay. So you'd almost like Socrates to maybe perhaps, you know, be the middleman between these two to, to uh, somehow use the Socratic method to make the future a bit better? I think so, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Because mm -hmm. um, even with a guy like Alexander, um, you can see quite strongly that he, I mean, he argues, um, he's, kind, he's kind of unique in contemporary aesthetics, architecture, design, philosophy, in that he, he will go out and argue for um, the objectivity of beauty. Um, he argues for um, a sort of objective hierarchy of, of design principles, um, some of which are, you know, he, he uses the language of wholeness and aliveness. Some of them are more whole and alive than others, and there are um, objective uh, ways of, of of observing that and employing it in your own design practices, and um, I tend to agree with him on an intuitive level. Um, but then, um, if I if I was you know to go through a sort of rigorously Socratic process of investigating um, my reasons for thinking that, I think I think Socrates could push me into aporia pretty quickly. Um, and so I'd, I would just like to see uh, what what does that look like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I think I think those three, though I don't too, know too much at all about Alexander, um, are, seem to be extremely applicable to what we're talking about. Um, so it certainly mm -hmm. seems to be, you know, Socrates, you know, running into the marketplace and annoying everyone. Um, so I mean, it's the big question, I guess, is how would you describe philosophy as a way of life? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's something that on the, on the face of it, there's not really anything deeper than what you might imagine. Philosophy as a way of life simply means that um, your philosophical views, values, beliefs, attitudes, um, reasons for thinking things are deeply tied uh, not just to your sense of reason and conceptuality, but to how you live out your life and how you relate um, to other people. 
So there's a very simple sense in which it's just living philosophy as though that it meaningfully bears on um, your whole person, your whole being, and uh, all of the interactions that you engage in, all of the different spheres of your life, um, work, personal, um, you know, social, cultural, all of these things. Um, for Hado, um, he's a little bit more specific in that he's talking about um, a sort of a, a difference or a, a separation between how we think of uh, philosophy or how it's often represented today as um, a kind of an isolated activity that academics engage in in a university in order to do, um, you know, to complete a course of study, to get a degree, perhaps to get a job, um, and that this is something that they do for other academics, and that that's kind of the that's kind of the expected sphere of where that kind of intellectual activity is. Hado recovers this other image of, of ancient philosophy that we see in the Platonists, uh, Aristotelians, Stoics, Cynics, Epicureans, so on, um, and later Neoplatonists and Christians, um, where the, the actual, the mode of doing philosophy, the structure of it is different. And so it's, it looks from our view, from our modern view today, more like something like a kind of a monastic community, a community of practice. So you're, you're working in a community setting with a very specific group of people. Uh, you're all practicing together um, and your school has, you know, a, a certain set of, of, of values or dispositions that you're pursuing through a mode of living and through a mode of practice this word eschesis again becomes important. Um, and so philosophy as a way of life is about this community oriented thing, but it's also um, when Hado talks about practices, he talks about um, things like uh, dietary practices. So there are different relationships to, to food and eating and fasting, uh, meditative or contemplative practices, you know, things that we would think of more as kind of um, mindfulness, exercises, you know, in today's, today's language. Um, and then also, you know, the, this, the sort of, uh, more, uh, sort of stereotypically conceptual, uh, rational linguistic modes of analysis that we think of as part of philosophy today. Um, but he groups these together under, um, uh, the, the, he takes this phrase spiritual exercises uh, from St. Ignatius, but he says this is really how we should think about it. Philosophy as spiritual exercise done in community for the sake of transformation. Um, mm -hmm. So there's a lot in there, but that's, that's th those are some of the ways you could think of doing philosophy as a way of life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So some, some people would ask, I mean, especially those who have this idea of, I mean, a lot of people who um, perhaps don't read, you know, uh, the the more dense philosophical tombs and might gravitate towards uh, not to sound too elitist but more pop philosophy or not not read it at all might at, at a glance think that that is what philosophy is and should be right like if it's not changing your life if it's not uh, a practice in the sense then then people might ask well okay so what's the point in philosophy otherwise right <laughs> um, so the negative response would be kind of the what I was saying before is that it's it's um, it's a vocation that you can put in a box that's separate from the other aspects of your life, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? So um, you know, philosophy in the vocational sense, philosophy not as a way of life, um, but as a means to an end, say, as a job, is something that you could do for three hours during your you know whatever your the lecture you're giving on, and then you just put that aside, and then you go. And do something completely different, and the rest of your life doesn't have any meaningful connection um, to those things. And then there are, you know, various degrees of, you know, integration um, in terms of the practices that you're engaged in. But then also, um, you know, how how else does that feed out into a larger community of people? You know, so that that community aspect um, has to has to be there somehow. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, uh, you've you've mentioned the word a couple of times, and as you said, that your um, your doctorate is is sort of centering around this term, ascesis. 
I was wondering mm-hmm. if you could you could just highlight what the importance of ascesis is in in philosophy as a way of life. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So a little background on the word um, ascesis is not a word that um, we see so often in in present day contexts, but you can see it related to the word ascetic and asceticism. Um, ascesis, uh, the Greek term, is slightly different than our modern sense of ascetic and asceticism. Um, asceticism, as we typically read it, is about renunciation or privation or, um, say, celibacy or a kind of a, a withdrawal. It's an abstinence, um, fasting, pulling away. Um, it's a, It kind of has a negative connotation you're withdrawing from certain activities you're abstaining from them in order to um typically as part of some kind of a purification practice Mm -hmm. some kind of a purification ritual um the greek term has that valence it also has an additional valence where you're also in pursuit of something you're in pursuit of value so you're not just withdrawing from certain negative things but you're in pursuit of positive things. Mm. So uh, pursuing uh, different virtues, different virtuous modes of living um, would be a kind of ascesis, um, the kind of training that athletes undergo to transform themselves, to pursue um, excellence in physical activity. That's a kind of ascesis as well. Um, and that that athletic metaphor comes up time and time again um, with with Hado and, and in his work that there's a kind of model in athleticism for how ascesis transforms yourself. You transform yourself through practice. You become something different, right? And this also extends into other pursuits like the arts, like learning um, learning a craft or uh, you know a musical instrument, learning how to paint. Um, the focus isn't so much on the product that you're creating, the the specific art, but the changes that you had to undergo in order to become that artist, right? So again, you have this sense that um, you have to become different in order to uh, perceive as an artist perceives and in order to communicate that to other people through the co- techniques of your craft. So those are you know some of the general ways you could think about um, ascesis. But for Hado, in terms of philosophy as a way of life, he sees ascesis as the primary philosophical issue, the the primary philosophical theme. Um, And he says that, um, this is my language now, but people often talk about uh, what is first philosophy, and some people will say metaphysics is first philosophy. Some people will say it's epistemology. Some people will say it's ethics, right? Mm-hmm. So there's a question of where do you begin? Um, and so for Hado, you begin with practice. Um, and the reason he says that is because, well, you have to look at what has already happened in order for you to think about metaphysics, in order for you to think about epistemology, in order for you to think about ethics. What has to happen, Hado says, is you have to have some means of bringing those things into view. In other words, there's if you can just imagine in a, in a kind of simplified way, you you maybe maybe through inheritance or you're through your culture or just through your unexamined uh, way of being in the world, you have a kind of um, automatic set of processes that are kind of filtering and organizing experience for you. You're kind of telling yourself a story about how things hang together, what your role in that story is, uh, what your agency is. So in order to do metaphysics or in order to do epistemology, how do I know that I'm right? How do I know anything at all? What is the world? How does it hang together? You've brought that into view. And that's a that practice, says Hado, where you have to you have to sit back. You have to kind of sit back and suspend the judgment, right? So um, for the skeptics, the, the school, um, phenomenologists also use this term, epoche, 
Um, epoche is a kind of ascetic practice. It's a, it's a practice of suspending judgment in perception so that you can reconsider what's actually happening, what is, what is actually happening. And so Hado says that basically all of the other um, philosophical categories come out of these sort of initial maneuvers in thought. And these are maneuvers that you don't just do once. Um, you have to do them continuously again and again, again and again. Um, and so that for Hado is the root of, of philosophical activity, philosophical way of life. It's rooted in these practices, um, not first in uh, memorizing theoretical arguments, uh, commitments, um, or he's... He's very uh, fond of pointing out that um, in the modern period, especially with the written word, um, printing press, and so on, um, philosophers got very interested in building whole systems. Mm -hmm. You know, and a lot of scholarship today is about uh, learning the systems of other philosophers. Um, and he's saying that this is kind of derivative or downstream of these more primary modes of practice that make these things possible to begin with. So the philosophy as a way of life, a sort of a skesis orientation to these things is to emphasize those practices that already have to exist before metaphysics, epistemology, ethics can, can even begin to articulate themselves. Mm. So for Hado, we've, we've sort of, have we, um, you know, from day one, almost found a way to uh, pry apart philosophy on one hand and philosophy with practice or practice philosophy is a way of life on the other hand right if it begins from practice then at a certain point we would have had to sort of pry it away and say look we're just going to do the the intellectual the written stuff yeah that's right um and he gives he gives a few different um accounts of how he thinks that happens um i don't know if we want to go get into you know all of the details now but it certainly has a lot to do with um the rise of the university system, um, the way the university system developed. He has a lot of thoughts on um, how philosophy relates to religion, in particular Christianity, um, and how that that kind of distribution of uh, practices and tasks kind of um, differentiate, or they kind of get, uh, on Hado's account at least, you kind of get um, the practices kind of end up in the religion camp and the conceptual reasoning aspect get lumped in with philosophy and then philosophy kind of loses uh, the practice element um it's a it, it, it's a, it's a complex picture i don't i don't think Hado is entirely right about the way that he describes that but the sense that because of different historical factors and institutional arrangements you get a separation of uh, of practices and um, thinking and reasoning, conceptual discourse, the two the two start to follow different lines, um, and that's not the image that we get um, at the root of these philosophical traditions in in the Platonists. It's a very different image of sort of practice and theory, um, not even just as two different things that complement each other, but um, the image is more that practice generate theoretical insight and so you actually are achieving insight through practice um so they're they're much more integrated in those in those contexts um than you you would often find in your sort of intro to philosophy course as a undergrad in a university well i guess it's quite difficult to teach uh practices because then you've sort of got to keep an eye on everyone and how they're doing and whether or not uh you know, certain, you know, practices, especially, you know, I mean, you've already mentioned the um, spiritual practices of Ignatius, um, you know, that some of those are quite severe, right? So it'd be quite difficult. It'd be yeah. interesting. I mean, do you, do you happen to know if any such course has attempted to do such a thing where uh, it's a philosophy course, which, you know, teaches practices as well? Is that a thing which is happening or has happened? Yeah, I do. I actually... Um... I spoke with a fellow. His name is Ryan Duns. He's a, a Jesuit, and he wrote a fan fantastic book. It's called Spiritual Exercises for a Secular Age, which is a book on 
Pierre Hadot, Charles Taylor, and um, William Desmond. Um, and so he's writing uh, as a Catholic, as a Jesuit, um, very much in this vein of how do we bring um, the theory and the practice together in this sense that we're talking about, and then how do you um, bring that into the classroom? And he does that. He's he's teaching at a, a Catholic university, so they already have um, you know some of that context kind of built into their their curriculum. So um, I think in this context, that's an advantage, but he does, um, different meditative exercises, different writing exercises, um, and that's part of his philosophy curriculum. So, um, you can definitely find, uh, models of people doing this, this kind of stuff, um, which I, th I think is all to the good. Uh, even there though, you're still talking about something, um, slightly different, um, and for good and for bad, I think, uh, because those students obviously just show up to that course, they do the exercises for credit, and then if they want to, they can they leave the course, and that's that's the only engagement that they're required to have of it. So it's not um, it's still not quite the same. Where this is um, something that you're carrying with you into all the other aspects of your life, but you can you can certainly in include it in a in a pedagogy in that sense. Mm -hmm. So uh, perhaps this is something you've you felt you've felt yourself as well i mean with with hado as well is there often a struggle with philosophy of practice to not get pulled too much into one camp so to speak so you know you don't want to get you don't want to become purely an academic who is writing about philosophy as li uh, as life but equally is there is there such a thing as almost like too much practice and you lose the the thread of the theory so to speak yeah i th i think so and that's why um, I mean, for me, at least, you know, writing is not just incidentally because I'm trying to get a degree Im important to my life, but there's something um, clarifying about the written word, you know, and there's, I think there's, there's a, a way of incorporating it as part of your complement of practices and exercises um, where it's it's a it's a very important thing where you know there's there's a there's a big discussion right about and, and people will talk about you know Plato sometimes disparaging uh, comments on on the written word and codifying things too much into writing and you know that's why um, the dialogues are dialogues because they're meant to be conversational and sort of modeling um, a kind of interaction that you'd want to have. Um, in philosophical discourse, but at the same time, um, it's it, it's the way of of the way of the writing where I think if it's experimental and open ended and uh, sort of phenomenologically rich and descriptive, where it, it it will bring out elements of the practice side of the experience. Uh, they the two the two work very well together. Um, for me and I think there the, the the issue is a little bit with the medium because once once you've written something down and especially once you've printed it and published it it's 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 there it's like frozen in time right um, and that can be good as a kind of a record uh, this is what I thought then or this is a, the best I could express uh, my views philosophically at that point in time um, but the world is alive, you're alive, and the, the process, that process of, of philosophical growth and change is ongoing. So I think it's just, it's just a matter of how do you relate to the writing? How do you relate to um, you know, conceptual and discursive conversation, that layer of things? I don't think it's at all about um, sort of taking an anti-intellectual stance to those things, but just recognizing that... Um, there are a lot of environments where those things can be greatly overemphasized to the point where it looks like that's the whole of it, mm -hmm. you know. And this is this is one of the things that um, I so appreciate about Hado, um, and he he takes these ideas from from Bergson and um, you know, people like Merleau Ponty, where when he's thinking, even when he's thinking about speculative philosophy, sort of in a technical sense, like how do we how do we write. Uh, good metaphysics. How do we tell um, 
you know, likely cosmologies, you know, likely stories, as 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 Plato said. Um, we do that from a place of not just intellectual rumination, but also from the standpoint of our feelings and the senses of our body. That those are hugely important in the accounts that we give about what the world is like and 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 our role in it. And so some of that is not discursive, but it can be brought into awareness, right? And so these are some of those kind of meditative practices, practices of self-examination, um, you know, this phrase, know thyself, is about being present to all of that, the, the whole sensorium, the whole spectrum of ways that we perceive and interpret things. Um, and that's um, not just not just discursive and not just intellectual, and yet that's that's the slice that gets um, given priority in a lot of contexts. And so it's it's not about getting rid of that. It's just about integrating all of the other all of the other faculties, say, into that conversation. Mm-hmm. I mean, this this discussion of um, faculties, in a way, is is, a, is an interesting one because often you know people sort of intellectualize philosophy um of course it's an intellectual pursuit but it that itself um puts forward a few problems with regards to the emotions the body you know when we think of exercises actually would i be right in thinking that the primary task of many of the exercises that hadome list or say of the stoics the epicureans are really related to uh, uh, the emotions or to the body to learning something from other faculties other than the intellectual faculties. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think it's, but again, it's about, it's about the coordination of them, you know? So there are, um, there's a therapeutic dimension here and there's a intellectual dimension here. And the two, the two are not opposed. Um, they're not playing a zero-sum game where you do one at the expense of the other. They actually uh, have a kind of circular causal connection with each other. And you see this again and again. You can see different thinkers in different time periods emphasizing the therapeutic dimension more than the the epistemological dimension, say. You can definitely see that weight. But I think in the final analysis, you're looking at how the two hang together. So you know, Hado took a tremendous amount from the Stoics and Stoic practices, you know, and one of those practices, um, this is another kind of, you know, self-examination practice, is um, an examination of representations, you know, representations in a kind of a technical sense. And the representations here has to do with one, um, the sensory impressions that are coming in from sort of your physical senses from your body, what are you perceiving in a kind of physiological way mixed with um, the Stoics call it the conditions of your soul. Um, the conditions of your soul are shaping representation based on your constitution. So the, the raw, there's the raw sense data isn't sort of telling you what's going on. It's the shaping of that data into representation through your constitution that tells you this is what's happening this is what i'm seeing these are the activities that are happening in front of me and then that's what you're drawing inferences from to do about what's going to happen next you're, you're making judgments about things and then you know you, the the reasoning faculties make judgments is this true or is this false i'm seeing this correctly is this in line with reason or not um, and so you have this whole um sort of anthropology Right, of how humans work and phenomenologically what's going on. Um, and in that case, it's a lot of it is geared towards the therapeutics of the passions, right? So you're, you're looking at, and passions in this context uh, doesn't mean like I feel really passionate about it. It means like um, sort of overwhelming emotions that are, you know, kind of triggering you or causing you to do things that uh, aren't in line with, with your, you know, your higher reason. Um, c- causing you trouble in your life, um, but you can see that that's a that's a kind of a rich epistemological account of um, how perceptions are made. Uh, you can see similar descriptions 
um, sort of in uh, sort of Kantian transcendental mm -hmm. idealism, um, it, Husserlian phenomenology. You know, they're they're likewise giving accounts of you know how do the categories of the understanding come together to shape you know the different you know objects and items in our perception. In Kant, you see that much. I mean, it's much more epistemologically oriented. You know, but it's the same sort of engagement with, okay, it's experiences are happening. I'm I'm participating in the construction of these experiences. There is a system by which my my body, my faculties are coming together to produce those experiences, um, and then they have some kind of uh, truth value. Um, and so you're making all of these evaluations, but all of these evaluations come from that standpoint of. Um, you, you, taking a taking a step back and kind of looking at the whole arrangement of things, um, and so again, that for Hadot is is sort of the philosophical move that kind of all of the others um, sort of depend on. So it's there's a therapeutic dimension there, mm. and then there's the intellectual epistemological dimension. But really, you're talking about the same process, um, and I think. Just in the same way that we we've seen a kind of um, bifurcation or differentiation between uh, what's philosophy proper and what's you know religion proper, say you could you could do the same thing here and say, oh well, a lot of what you're talking about right now that's psychology. You know that's what psychologists, you know, cognitive behavioral therapists kind of operate with um, a similar language about you know evaluating. Um, your behaviors and the cause and effect of the way you represent things versus the way they are, um, but that that differentiation between philosophy and psychology is also not quite so. Uh, it's not so severe in in the in the ancient context that Hado is concerned with. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's an interesting idea to think about trying to use the critique of pure reason as a therapeutic text. Do you think such a thing could be done? You, you could I do stuff like that all the time. <laughs> I, oh, wow, I'd love. I mean, I'd love to hear a couple of examples if if you have them. Well, there's there's what I was already discussing, which I think is that if you can if you can bring into view, and I'm not, I, I actually don't think that at the end of the day, this is why the uh, the sort of the, the the conceptual systemic apparatus has to stay online because. Uh, at the end of the day, I'm not I'm not a Kantian. Um, I don't think he got everything right um, in that sense. I think what he did is very interesting and important, but I don't think it's right. But from the standpoint of um, is is there a therapeutic dimension to <laughs> the transcendental transcendental idealism, transcendental philosophy? I think the answer is yes, and I think the answer is yes because. Um, this attempt to articulate theory, I think, starts from a place of dis-ease. I think, you know, Kant is having, and this is this is something that Hadot will often say too, is that a lot of uh, philosophical pursuits, the choice of which philosophy to pursue as a way of life, starts with a kind of a, a metanoia, a kind of a conversion experience, a kind of a shock. Of some kind, um, and I think that this is what happened. You know, Kant is telling us about reading Hume, and you know, the scales fall from his eyes, and he wakes from his dogmatic slumber. I think that's a sh he's had some kind of a shock, mm -hmm. and things are now things are kind of chaotic, and disarray. His his worldview is broken a bit, um, and he can't. He kind of can't go on. He he can't really figure out. What's this all about? How does this all hang together? And so he writes a series of books. Um, I mean, he's trying to put it all back together again mm -hmm. in a way that makes sense to him. So, I mean, I'm adding a lot of my own sort of conjecture here, but I, I think it starts from a kind of a shock like that. And then the theory is itself is a kind of attempt to put you back um, into, a, into a state where you feel like you feel like you make sense as part of the whole, mm. you know, and Kant is reconstructing a different kind of whole um, that's, you know, trying to recuperate, um, you know, the advances of the sciences of his time so that things can philosophically make sense to him again. Um, but I think 
that's that's where the the therapeutic dimension is the the theory is is trying to put him in a different place mm. right and so there's a there's a therapeutic dimension even even to that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it's strange i mean a lot of philosophers who write you know i'm thinking of simone Weil would be a key example of someone who you know is writes of their own philosophical practice but doesn't really give let's say therapeutic steps for anyone who's reading about it and going well clearly she had some sort of practice but she's she's writing of the experience and not of the steps and perhaps we could say that Kant is doing the same thing and it'd be interesting to uh, you know I'm trying to think back to the uh, the biography by Manfred Kuhn but I can't remember too much of whether or not Kant would have been doing such things but I mean I guess to think that his his you know his um what what was it 3 p.m walk every day was probably something mm -hmm. of a uh, therapeutic, you know, practice for him, which <clears throat> which allowed him certain things. But it's, you know, it's intriguing as to whether many philosophers, there's a history of philosophers who simply haven't written down the fact of their own practice and perhaps took that as a foregone conclusion for anyone who's studying philosophy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I think that's true. Um, and I think... A lot of these things fall into a category of um, I don't know how I want to say it. I think I think you can get over explicit and over rule bound in what these things look like, and I think that there are a lot of ways where you can engage in them um, outside of. Um, the context of some kind of like formal training where what you're doing has a, 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 an explicit name that's tied to a school and a lineage mm. or something like that. I think there are lots of examples like that of, of people doing these things. Um, and I think uh, Hado actually writes about Kant, um, writes about um, a connection with, with, with both Descartes and, and Kant about um, their connections to, to sort of stoic practice and, um, stoic views and uh, he he definitely sees Kant as part of this practice tradition um, and then so I, I think it's always explicit as you're saying and then sometimes it's extremely explicit like with Descartes and for whatever reason um, it's just not the way people interpret it like the caricature of, mm. of Descartes versus what Descartes is actually um, asking you to do uh, quite different things. The meditations are literally meditations, you mm -hmm. know, and he gives you a sequence of them. He lays out, you know, a formula, a series of steps, meditative activities that you're supposed to engage in. And those meditative activities are sort of where the meat is for Descartes. He's saying this, this is, these are the steps you should take. Um, and those that's that's a that's a very sort of philosophy as a way of life orientation. Um, we think of him as the sort of arch modernist, um, the, the the person who inaug inaugurates a sort of a a whole different mode of doing philosophy. Um, and even you know Hado has a a number of of uh, rich engagements with with Michel Foucault. Um, and he even Foucault says this. Foucault is, you know, the the Cartesian moment. He says is when we move from um, from tr from truth and philosophy as realized through practice and transformation to truth as realized through evidence that doesn't require a change in the subject. Mm -hmm. That's that's Foucault's definition of. Um, the shift that we see in the modern era. There's mm -hmm. no transformation required of the subject. All you need is the right evidence. And he mm -hmm. says, Descartes is the, the person where we see this most clearly. Um, and then Hado kind of says, pause, hold on a second. This is the guy who's asking you go to go through a series of transformative meditative exercises that he lays out for you. How is, how is he the, the, the place where this shift is marked? Um, so there's all this ambiguity around where is where is practice? Are we practicing today? Is writing one of the practices? Is theoretical discourse a practice? You know, and so it's all it's all kind of gray, honestly. Mm -hmm. um, 
but you can see so uh, part of what i try to look at in the disser dissertation is what where are the practices happening and where are they not you know and is that not a better way of of addressing this question so in other words it might not be pre-modern versus modern or philosophical versus religious or institutional versus autodidactic uh, but um, people who are regularly practicing and people who are not um, and that distribution of people is very messy there are people who are inside of institutions doing it there are people outside of institutions doing it there are um, you know, people who are explicitly religious in orientation doing it and people who are explicitly religious who are not, you know, so it's, it's kind of all over the place. Just out of interest, I mean, you know, this blame put on Descartes by Foucault, do you, do you see um, a certain moment in history or maybe even a certain thinker where perhaps they're not entirely, you know, the, the cause of, of the move towards entirely theoretical, you know, as you say, you just need the evidence. But do you see a, a movement or even a series of thinkers that we could say that was where the, the tide began to turn? Or do you think it's all it's well, just grey across the board? Uh, it's, it's hard to say because um, even Foucault will push back a little bit and say, okay, now I, I don't mean people literally think that Descartes had a new thought. And then after that, everybody started thinking in a Cartesian way. So he talks about like a Cartesian moment mm. that's spread across centuries, essentially. Mm. Um, and it has to do with, you know, advances in the sciences and, you know, mathematics, physics, uh, evolution. Uh, there's, there's a number of things happening at the same time over you know a period of several hundred years that's really reorienting um both the physics you know how we describe the world and how it hangs together and how the human being fits into that picture and uh relates to the you know the rest of the cosmos and i think there even if there's not a distinct uh like day or moment or thinker that sort of inaugurates this whole shift, you do see a shift where, um, you know, one of the one of the key exercises, and this is why I think um, Hado's account of of philosophical practice is very different from um, sort of today's pop philosophy or psychology or kind of the self help literature. Uh, one of the ways that's so different is that the, the cosmology um, is key. It's one of the facets. Mm. Um, and figuring out how you fit into uh, the logos, the, the larger logos, the, co the cosmos, and how, how you participate in it. Um, that image, there was more of a sympathy between, you know, the full breadth of your human experience, your first person experience, including, you know, all of the sort of qualitative valuations and things that you're encountering, that had a much greater sympathy with the larger sort of cosmic story than the modern picture. And so I think the the real separation that you see and the one to really pay attention to is this, this sense that somehow um, through some of these transformations, you kind of get um, a really disjointed anthropology where um, the experiential quality of your experience, the, the, the phenomenological sort of um, arena, uh, is is it's it's difficult to uh, resolve it with the uh, mechanistic image of the sciences. So you either get um, some kind of austere dualism. Um, like in, in Descartes, or you get a kind of an epiphenomenalism where you kind of have to lop off the, the qualitative side. Um, it's, not, it's not really real in the sense that um, the universe described by physics is real. And so all of these changes are, are happening through this modern transition. And that has a distinct um, rise to it. Um, and a distinct set of effects that you can kind of see in the organization of 
of society through our use of technology, through use of you know increasingly advanced forms of knowledge. So there's there's a tremendous difference there between um, you know the the types of things that we're trying to uh, synthesize and come to grips with today in terms of worldview and um, you know that the pre-modern image, which you could say is, you know, is a pre-Cartesian image or whatever. So there's definitely a difference there. Um, but the, the number of factors that are kind of involved in that shift, I think you can't, you can't sort of pinpoint one, one person or idea as the, mm. the center of it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. You know, I'm interested, you mentioned this, this book about, um, Spiritual exercises for a secular age, which seems almost uh, contradictory even in its title, right? Spiritual, spiritual and secular. Do you think the same practices can apply across across the board, or do you think that there's been a, a clear difference in what you, we'd consider philosophy as a way of life? You know, as as we've moved into and then out of uh, predominantly religious cultures. Yeah, it's a good question. I'm trying to think just because already already in that Greek context in Athens, say, you can see so many of the same um, problems and issues that that we discuss today in terms of you know the problem of of, of pluralism uh, the question of uh, relativism, um, do you know uh, perennialism versus historicism? Um, you know all these all these types of questions that um, can be tempting to think as sort of artifacts of the postmodern mind are are there. Um, so I have to think that these practices are emerging in the context of those conversations. And so to that extent, I think modern, postmodern, secular, post-secular society still has a tremendous amount to learn from those traditions. Mm. Um, I don't think, I think to some extent it's, it's also a mistake to think of those practices and philosophical schools as set dogmas. Mm. Um, and so Hado describes them as the experimental laboratories, experimental labs. Each school is a, is a, 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 a set of experiments, experiments in transformation, experiments in perception, experiments in investigation. Um, and so if that's true, then that's the kind of thing that we should be doing anyway. And we're still, you know, I talked about epoche before, or, you know, these kinds of self-examination practices. Um, if there's a connection between, you know, stoic therapeutics and Kantian transcendental idealism, like there's, there's a there there to what's being explored. And so to some extent, I think the techniques themselves the experiments themselves are what need to be um, uh, continually engaged in, you know, and so not necessarily uh, a specific metaphysical image that we may have left behind because of changes in, in physics and science, but the, the practices that deliver those insights. Um, so th the book that you mentioned, Ryan Dunn's book, he is really trying to do... Um, it's a great book. I think you would enjoy it. And I think you'd probably enjoy speaking with him as well. He's trying to ask these questions, the wake of um, sort of 20th century uh, postmodernism deconstruction. It's a lot of engagement with Heidegger, uh, Derrida. Um, you know, this word onto theology is big, big theme. Um, can we do metaphysics um, in in the 21st century? And can we do metaphysics as a uh, practice of living? You know, and those are those are all big questions. And so I, I don't know if I'm directly answering your question, but I think 
the the practices have served us so far and i think we need to continue to draw from them um because in some sense they've 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 they are the things that have shaped um you know our our big insights throughout history and again it's not because we want to cling to this or that story but we want to keep those practices alive and fresh and and available you know this this idea that um you can you can lose not just you know texts you know texts fall out of translation um they fall out of circulation we forget about them but whole practices and ways of being also you know disappear um so i think whatever you know whatever small piece of that puzzle we can all play um that's that's the way to do it is is just keeping those those practices alive because they will by themselves um adapt and respond to new contexts i think mm -hmm. okay okay so where do you what do, if if you do where do you think people might get philosophy as a, as a way of life wrong do you think that perhaps it's been a little bit um abused by i don't want to name any authors because i'm sure they're good people but many very pop philosophy authors you see them as on bestsellers lists do you think mm -hmm. that it's been a bit you know dragged into this um a quick fix philosophy right you know um there's certain certain books that, which are bestsellers which seem to sort of apply but don't really take it all that seriously as a sort of a quick fix just to to not care right yeah, yeah. There's, I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot of that happening, and that's definitely um, true. I, I, I try not to be overly, overly judgmental about. I don't, I don't go out of my way to look for things to be judgmental about. I, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I have, I have my judgments. I have enough of them already. So if I, I don't, I don't need more. Um, but that, that's, that's definitely a, a thing that's happening. I want to say, and I want to think that if that is, if those you know versions of these texts, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of popular stoicism out there today, sort mm -hmm. of pop stoicism. Um, if that helps you live a, a you know a, a better, fuller, healthier life, then that's a good thing, unambiguously. I think. Um, is that the end of it? No, I don't. I don't think so. So maybe that can be a lead into something else. Um, I don't know. Um, there's quite a lot of um, what Evan Thompson calls Buddhist modernism that um, falls into the same category. I think that um, you know, there's a great discussion between Evan Thompson and and. Sam Harris that um, I think if you're if you're interested in these questions that f folks should check out which is you know basically an account of how all of these traditions and, and Buddhism shares um, tremendous um, overlap in, in terms of its transformation in, in the modern mind as, as the philosophies that we're discussing today does um, and it's it's the same thing there where I mean, mindfulness practice is not the whole of the you know hundreds of traditions of south asian philosophy and buddhism you know and there's all of the you know rich phenomenology a sort of kind of transcendental idealism you could even say propositional analysis metaphysics um all of that stuff in the 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 buddhist traditions um and you know to kind of have that turn into uh, you know the, the 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 ten minutes of mindfulness that you get at the your corporate retreat or whatever is a little bit you know it hurts your your soul a little bit to see that. Um, but again, if if it helps you, that's a good thing. And so in, instead of thinking about it from you know what I think people are doing wrong, I just try to. Um, flesh out the whole picture as I see it and make that available um, to people, which I think is, you know, it has, it has a, 
um, cosmological dimension in terms of you know metaphysics. It has um, thoughts on ethics and epistemology. It has thoughts on um, you know politics and community responsibility. So I think you know there's something about philosophy is all of those things and requires of us all of those things. And so if you're just doing um, a small slice of sort of self-help therapy, that's not philosophy, mm. right? So maybe you could draw that distinction mm. that, um, okay, whatever else this is, uh, it's a simplification. Uh, maybe it's a little bit anti-intellectual or whatever, um, but you can safely say it's not philosophy. Mm. Philosophy is is a whole that includes a, a lot of other activities in it and you need to be doing um for philosophy as a way of life uh, you need to be doing all of those things right so do you mind if i ask what's um what's a practice or perhaps a series of practices if you like which might have profoundly changed your life mm -hmm. yeah um i do i have a number of them that i think of as sort of uh sort of regular exercises. I do um, different kinds of fasting. Um, I, I find extremely helpful. Um, I do two different kinds of sort of meditative exercises. One is um, a kind of a basic sort of just a, a, a sitting breathing exercise. Um, and then the other one is comes out of the contemplative prayer tradition, um, which is... Uh, this is again why the philosophy, religion, spirituality divide doesn't doesn't quite work for me. So you know, contemplative prayer exercises, um, and then one other thing that that we haven't discussed um, is this notion in in um, in the Platonic context again of of theoria, mm -hmm. which is where we get our word theory but this word theoria it's both uh, it, it marks a kind of a festival activity and a kind of a journey and there's a great book Andrea Nightingale um, it's more more of a historical anthropological text but she does a great job of um, recovering the sense of theoria both as festival and as journey in this book. And basically you would go to these uh, festivals. These are sort of ritually organized ceremonies and festivals. And ideally you go to somebody else's festival. So you leave town, you go to somebody else's town and you go into, uh, and she gives, she gives these descriptions of them where it's like you, you enter into a space of, um, visual sacredness. So you're in some kind of a temple setting that's very sort of um, ceremonial and aesthetic. It's aesthetically charged um, in a what we would think of in a kind of a religious way. You have some kind of a rite, some kind of an experience, um, and then you take that experience back with you home uh, and you give an account. You tell people what happened. And the experience, the journey is transformative. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we see this word theoria in some of the dialogues. It's in the it's in the Phaedo. Um, the, the 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 journey into the afterlife is a kind of theoria. Um, so it's that kind of thing. It's a kind of a death rebirth kind of thing. Um, and this we're told is central to the philosophical life, the philosophical project. You could easily see this as as being the the thing that triggers. A kind of a conversion experience, a kind of a metanoia, um, a turning around, um, a turning towards something else, turning away from your uh, current life into your your new philosophical life, and so that um, that to me is um, something that I've experienced in in my own life and my own ways um, through uh, psychedelic experiences, uh, which I didn't have this kind of language for it all when um, experiencing them, but it very much had just that experience of kind of triggering a philosophical uh, reorientation, a pursuit for um, wisdom, love of wisdom. There, and there, 
the sense that there's some kind of a there there to the question of wisdom and to the question of of truth. So, you know, regular these kind of regular daily ascetic practices, but also these kind of more uh, charged uh, conversion experiences um, have been a big part of my life. Um, and I mean, I could talk about other things. I always feel like when you give this grocery list of, of practices, it doesn't ever kind of convey uh, the full sense. But um, I find the, the athletic metaphor extremely appealing. I've done um, mixed martial arts, different kinds of martial arts, different kinds of physical training my whole life. I can see very intuitively what that connection is like, um, becoming something different through practice. Um, how that changes your perception. So, yeah, I mean that that all kind of comes together, and the 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 breadth of those practices is kind of what uh, drew me to Hado because he was really the first person who kind of, um, in a very straightforward and coherent way, kind of gave me uh, something to hang all of those different activities on, and say, hey, this is philosophy. Mm-hmm. This is this is. Um, this is justifiably what you could call a philosophical life. And I thought, huh, that's a, that's a, uh, helped me integrate a lot of those, those different things. Is that where you'd advise people to begin with philosophy as a way of life then with Hado's text? Yeah, that, uh, well, he's got a, he's a good one called what is ancient philosophy, um, which I think is quite a good overview. Um, they've also now published, um a few collections of essays those are nice because you can um kind of just jump in and out uh you know they're shorter shorter little pieces that you can read one at a time um there's a great uh book that i was actually just reading called the present alone is our happiness it's a collection of interviews um with hido so if you like that kind of conversational style you also get a lot of his his biography um, in those works, and I think he's a he's a clear case. I think of somebody's biography and personal history overlapping quite clearly with their philosophical development and mm-hmm. um, the overall. Um, I at least see the way he talks about. Um, philosophy as a whole and the relation between philosophy and religion as uh, clearly uh, biographical. I mean, it kind of comes right out of, he has two major periods in his life, 20 years in Catholic seminary, uh, leaving the, leaving the church and then another 20 or so years as a um, philologist and historian. Um, And the, 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 the philosophy, because he's articulating of, it's not just a history. He's articulating a, a view of what philosophy is, right? It's mm-hmm. it's his. He's also giving that account, and it's to me very obviously a um, a product of these two major phases in his life. I think mm-hmm. so. But I think I think he's he is um, he's dense and thorough, um, but also erudite and clear. Um, so he's not. Uh, he's not like some of the other uh, uh, French philosophers on the in the twentieth century. He's he's not gonna um, he's not gonna have you pulling your hair out because of his style. Um, so I I think you could start anywhere really. Mm-hmm. Okay, where where did you start? Was it Hado? Uh, in terms of like reading philosophy? Uh, no, uh, I guess I guess you know maybe the text where you oh the you, text you, uh, we had. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, I think we had some essays of his assigned. Um, I took a course uh, many years ago. I believe it was called Philosophy as Spiritual Exercise mm-hmm. or something. Um, and it was greatly inspired by Hado, but then we would read um, philosophical texts uh, from other thinkers in, from that perspective. You know, of of the practice oriented perspective, um, and I, I don't remember what I started with, um, but there. Yeah, I would say what is the ancient philosophy is probably you know the intro to that book 
is a great place to start. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. Well, just at the end here, I mean, do you, do you want to um, just discuss the, the side view and, uh, you know, the, the projects you're working on? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I'd love to. Um, so the side view is actually the, so there are, there are a couple of people who have picking up this theme of ascesis and are in dialogue with Hado um, about um, both Hado's conception of ascesis and uh, how we might um, sort of bring that term into the foreground. One of them is uh, Michel Foucault, who I already mentioned. The other one is Peter Sloterdijk, um, who likewise picks up uh, ascesis um, in what he calls a... a uh, general eschatology or eschatology um, in his book, You Must Change Your Life, uh, where he engages with with Hado quite a bit. Um, But the reason I'm bringing him up up is because he has um, another short little book translated into English, and I can never remember the name. It's philosophy, the wisdom of philosophy, something like it's a short little book anyway. Um, And in it, he takes this sort of practice-oriented view of philosophy and says, wouldn't it be interesting if we, um, instead of gave a history of philosophy as a series of completed texts and insights or a chronology of thinkers and what they did, we instead gave a history of the practices that gave us those insights and gave us um, those different philosophical uh, values, mm-hmm. and he he just said, and he he talks about scientists, artists, and philosophers in the same same way. Mm-hmm. Um, he says we could then look at history as though from a side view, and see uh, what made those artists, scientists, and philosophers in the first place. Mm-hmm. And so I thought, ah, oh, this is like kind of a different. Um, you know, people will talk a lot about uh, a meta view, kind of outside and beyond um, as a kind of um, uh, philosophical move to kind of look at, you know, larger patterns and things like that. I thought there's something interesting about the the orthogonal, looking at it not from above, but from the side. And so the side view um, is inspired by that sense that this is a way of looking. It's a way of looking at uh, the practices that create the developmental shifts in perception that give us interesting artists, scientists, philosophers, whatever, mm-hmm. um, athletes, engineers. Um, and so I took these ideas that we've been talking about um, to a larger group and said, you know, there are people in different disciplines who are also, you know, concerned with the question of perception and transformation. Um, and so I just kind of used that as a as a kind of scaffolding um and now uh we're working into our fourth fourth issue we've published uh three issues of the journal uh we do you can read all of the essays free online um at the sideview.co um you can also buy uh, a digital download and a print copy of the journal um and we try to organize uh, loosely each issue around different themes. Um, and what we're working on right now is um, really the relationship between thinking and place, or thinking and especially designed place. So thinking and architecture. Um, and so you, you can kind of see there that philosophy as a way of life, again, is about a certain kind of setting it's not just uh, an individual mind having private thoughts. It's about the community and the setting. Is there are there architectural settings that promote philosophy as a way of life more than others? Um, so, just invited a number of architects to kind of think philosophically about what they do. Um, many inspired by this fellow Christopher Alexander that I mentioned at the beginning. So, um, we do some podcasts like this as well. It's mostly mostly the publication and um i think you know if folks are interested in what you're doing they'd definitely be interested in the side view so you know i'd welcome that that overlap and that you know that that conversation and especially participation if it 
you know, seems exciting to uh, any of your listeners, if they, you know, check it out, then, you know, feel free to, to, to reach out and um, just let me know what you're up to. Cause that's, that's a big part of it is creating. Um, I'm sure you've thought about this as well with your, with your podcast, creating new uh, media mediums for uh, exchange conversation, um, dissemination of, of these ideas as um, you know, the Academy in some sense gets in, increasingly uh, inaccessible, both for you know, financial and material reasons, but also um you know this this divide between uh, intellectual life and everything else also continues to grow. So we're trying to uh, we're trying to create a different sort of culture around that through through the publication. Mm. And that's the sideview dot io dot co. Oh, dot co. Sorry, I'll put yeah. the uh, I'll make sure the links are in the description. Yeah, um, that'd be cool. Yeah, that's that's all sounds great. I'm sure there'll be a lot of people from this listener base who will probably pop on over. So um, yeah. That'd be cool. All right. Well, Adam, Robert, this has been really fun. Thanks very much. Yeah, great. Thanks so much for having me. I really enjoyed it.